I base this, you know, we've talked the last couple weeks, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is known as the love chapter. And I, I don't, I'm not going to ask you to stand because I'm going to read the entire chapter today of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In 1 Corinthians 13, chapter uh, verse number 1, he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and all, though I have all the faith so that I can remove mountains, if I don't have love, I have nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, if I have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether they be prophecies, they will fail. And whether there will be tongues, they will cease. Whether there will be knowledge, it will vanish away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see verse number 12 In the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know just as I have been known. For now abideth hope, or faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest is love. Why don't you just look at that person next to you and just say, I love you this morning. God forbid if you're sitting next to your spouse that that's the first time they've heard it today. Hopefully you've already been able to tell them that in the morning on the way to church because sometimes things are tough. Falling in love with Jesus. You know, there's love and there's lust. The lust are things of the flesh that we deal with. And I know we talk about pornography, but man, you, you can love a car you can, you can, and you can envy and even the Ten Commandments talks about coveting what your brother has or your, or your neighbor's wife or all these different things. Sometimes we say we love, but it's really lust. It's just our flesh that isn't real. But God's love is pure and it's genuine and it's not selfish and all these things that I mentioned here. And what I wanted to talk about today, because we've talked about it over the last few weeks, is, is just a, a few people in the Bible, a couple people anyway, that just had to fall in love with God and love Him more than anything. If they wouldn't have loved God, we wouldn't be sitting here today. We wouldn't have the opportunity that we have today. You can talk about Noah. He would be the first one that comes to my mind. Here's Noah that fell in love with Jesus. He finds himself in a predicament. The Bible says that he was perfect in the sight of God. We've talked about Job. The Bible says he was perfect in the sight of God. We go around saying nobody's ever been perfect but Jesus. But according to the Bible, Job was perfect in the sight of God, and so was Noah. Now, we're not perfect, but we need to strive and do the best we can and not make that an excuse just to mess up all the time, right? But Noah was perfect when it came to the things of the Lord. And here he was with his wife and his three children, Ham, Sham, and Japheth. What weird names. Aren't you glad you ain't named Ham? Wouldn't that be terrible? Or Porky or Bacon or whatever your name would be. Ham, Sham, and Japheth. And God comes and he speaks to Noah in Genesis chapter number 6, verse number 5. I want to read it with you today. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually 
Does that sound any different than the world that we live in today and what we're dealing with today? Verse number 6, And the Lord, listen to this, was sorry that He made man on this earth. God repented for even creating man because He was so upset with the evil that has happened and the evil that was going on. And he was grieved in his heart. Verse number 7, So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made him. Amen. But look at verse number 8. But Noah found grace in the sight of God. And in this evil world that we live in with Al-Qaeda and Hamas and terrorism and all the social media and all the things when God could look down upon this world and say, you know what? I repent once again from even sparing this world from the flood. He can find a group of people that love him and can say, but you have found grace in the sight of God because you have fallen in love with Jesus. Somebody shout praise the Lord. Verse number 22 of Genesis chapter 6. Then Noah, Noah did according to all that the Lord God had commanded him to do, so he did. He listened to the voice of God. He obeyed the voice of God. Can I ask you this morning, are you listening to the voice of God? Are you obeying what the good Lord tells you to do? Sometimes he'll tell you to lay things down. And sometimes he'll tell you to raise things up. Sometimes he'll tell you when you need to move. And sometimes he'll tell you when you need to just stand still and wait upon the Lord. Amen. Amen. How does God, or how does a man, I should say, not God, how does man hear the voice of God, take his wife and children, and save the human race? Remember, it had never rained upon this earth. He was building something that he had no idea what he was building. He was working on a building. He was working on the ark. And he was made fun of. And and we don't really know how long. There's a lot of scholars. I'm not going to get into that today. They'll say how many years it took him to build the ark. But it took him a long time to do it. And here the people would make fun of him. And the people would ridicule him and say, What in the world are you doing? Why are you building an ark? And he said, because it's going to rain. What's rain? We don't even know what rain is. And you know what? We live in an evil and perverse world. They say, what in the world are you doing? Why are you coming to church? Why are you living for God? Why are you reading your Bible? Why'd you quit cussing? Why'd you quit smoking crack with me? Why'd you quit doing dope with me? Why? Because you may not see exactly what God has for you, but you know the rain is coming. And you know God has something greater in store for you. Amen. Why did God choose Noah? Because God knew that he was a man that had fallen in love with God. If God needs something done in these last days, are you a man or a woman of God that God could look down upon you and say, you know what? She's been found faithful. He's been found faithful in all that he does. What if your faithfulness was the deterring factor of whether the human race would continue to exist or not? What if just your actions and your walk with God, everything upon this world came down to you and who you are? I don't know about you, but there's some of you, man, our world would be in trouble. We wouldn't have church. You know, my dad used to say that little saying all the time. If every member of this church was just like me, what kind of church would this church be? Amen. There's some of you, I'd say, man, you'd be faithful. We'd be in good shape. The lights would still be on. We'd still be helping people. But man, if everybody in the church was like some, 
I don't even know if we'd have church today because that's predetermined. It depends on what kind of mood you're in this morning. Man, that's good preaching right there, Brother Ronnie. I don't care who you are. Hey, it's true this morning. What if everything depended on your love of Jesus? Can I tell you this morning? It does. That there is a world and there is a destiny and there is a circle of influence that you have in your life that your faithfulness to God could determine the faithfulness of generation after generation after generation. I want you to notice here that that Noah had his house in order. He loved God so much that his wife loved God. He loved God so much that his children believed in what he was doing. He loved God so much that even his daughter-in-laws bought in to what he was doing. If some of you had to determine determine the relationship with your daughter-in-law or son-in-law, we'd be in a heap of trouble this morning. Somebody say, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. You notice it didn't say anything about Noah's mother-in-law. It didn't say anything about his father-in-law, did it? But here's Noah, his wife, Ham, Sham, and Japheth, and their wife, and the entire world is saved because of the love that people had for God and to do what is right. Folks, you have to do what is right if you're the only one in the building doing it. You've got to bow your head to pray when no one else will bow their head to pray. You've got to fight when you don't feel like fighting. You've got to pray and fast when you don't feel like praying fast. You've got to push through it and be a lover of God in everything that you do. Amen. Amen. I quickly want to touch very quickly on Abraham. Abraham, chapter uh, as mentioned in Genesis chapter 12, Now the Lord said to Abram, because God changed his name, didn't he? Abram at the beginning. He said to Abram, Get out of your country for your family, uh, with, uh, from your family and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. It didn't say, Abram, get out of your com- country and take your kids. It didn't say, he didn't have any at this point. It didn't say, take your family. It didn't say, take your nephew Lot. It said, leave your family behind and go and do what I want you to do so that you could be what I want you to be. In verse number 2, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and ye shall be a blessing. And you know Abraham's grandson, Abraham, Isaac, then Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And the Israel that we see on television right now being under scrutiny is the same Israel that God is talking about here in Genesis chapter 12. And he said in verse number 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse, the, curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Why do we care about Israel? Why do we care about what's going on there? Because God says, if you love them, I'll love you. But if you curse them, I'll curse you. Because those are God's chosen people. If you believe it, say amen today. Hallelujah. He said, leave. He said, leave. But you know what? Even in their heart-loving Jesus, they made mistakes. Noah and Abraham did both. Noah you can read later, ends up after everything that God did, after the earth is spared and the waters go up and the waters go down, he winds up going and getting drunk, laying naked. His sons had to walk in backwards because it was a sin and abomination to look upon the nakedness of your father. And they looked, or they reached back and to cover him up. And Ham looked upon his father's nakedness and God cursed him with a curse and told him that he would be the servants of his other brothers. And that's what led to a slavery for the descendants of Ham for thousands and thousands of years. Here was a man who was perfect in the sight of God. He was a lover of God, but he made a mistake. Amen. Abraham is told, leave your family, but he brings Lot, his nephew, You know the whole story of Sodom and Gomorrah and how it had to be destroyed. 
Abraham put himself in a horrible situation because he did not obey what God had told him to do. You can love God but still disobey God. God can have an intention for your life and a calling on your life, but you can mess it up because you put your own conditions on it. There even came a point in time when Abraham found himself getting ready to be in a situation that he lied and said that his wife was his sister. They must have lived in Arkansas or something. I don't know what was going on there. Woo! That's a joke. Over your head. Thank God we'll go on. Amen. Amen. He said, if they ask who you are, tell them you're my sister. And Sarah just looks at him like, what kind of like Leanna looks at me half the time? What? You know what? Even the evil king knew that he was lying. He tried to lie, tried to work it out on his own, tried to make the conditions out on his own. He said, you know what? I'm in my 80s now. don't have any children. Sarah comes up with this great idea. Why don't you just sleep with a handmaid and have a, have a child with her? Abraham's like, are you sure? Is this a test? No. I can't have you any children. Go ahead. And they have a child by the name of Ishmael. And Ishmael become the Ishmaelites. And they settle in the Middle East in a little area that we call the Gaza Strait and are now referred to as the Palestinians. Man, that's a history lesson for you today. The very Hamas and the Al-Qaeda that attacked those innocent children and beheaded them and raped the women in the streets all came because Abraham made a mistake and he tried to help God. Honey, God don't need your help. He just needs you to love Him and trust Him. Some of you this morning that God has a call on your life, but you keep trying to do it on your own. You say, God, I'll give you this, but I won't give you that. God, I'll will and deal. Hey, he's not on let's make a deal. He's not on the price is right. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And we are paying today for a man that loved God who left his country, but he made mistakes. You know what, friend? We reap what we sow. There are some of you that have tried to blame God for the situations that you're going through in your life, but, honey, it wasn't God's fault. Those are choices that you made a long time ago. And sometimes God gets blamed for it, and he didn't have anything to do with it, did he? But here's Noah. Here's Abraham. Here they are. You say... How do I know that God loves me? You know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But for some of you, that's just not enough. You think, how could a God love me but give me the daddy that he gave me? How could God love me but me wind up in foster care or raised by my grandparents or raised in the environment that I'm in? Again, It's reaping what's been sowed. And those are things that you just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But my Bible tells me in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse number 3 that before you were formed in your mama's belly that he knew you and he loved you and he ordained you to be a prophet in the last day. There is no such thing as an accident in the sight of God. And we can read what he said in Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love to us that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He loves us just the way we are, but he refuses to leave us that way this morning. And there's some of you, the problems you have in your life, maybe you were saved when you were little. You were only saved because somebody scared you, because you were worried about going to hell. And you know what? We all need that hell insurance, right? But I want a relationship with God. I want to serve God. I want him to be my friend. I want to speak to him every day that I live. And there's some of you this morning, you're struggling because you have not fallen in love with Jesus. Jesus is just a name you call when you don't have anything else and nowhere else to go. God is just a name followed by a four-letter cuss word when you get mad and hit your hand on a hammer. 
and you've heard him mocked all of his life. And there's some of you that may have even been baptized, but you didn't understand what you were baptized into. I'm telling you, I've been baptized in the love of God. Amen. Amen. When I wake up in the morning, he's the first one I talk to. Amen. When I'm in my car on the way to work, I talk to him. Amen. When I'm going through work and I'm walking from here to there, I'm talking to my Lord. I'm thanking him for my children. I'm thanking him for my wife. I'm thanking him for my heritage. I'm thanking him for all that he's done for me because I have a relationship with him. When's the last time you talk to him? When's the last time you talk to him without asking him for something? Because to some, he's just a genie in a bottle. You go on and mess up and screw up your life so bad that you can't even tell which ends up, and then you'll go rub on the genie, and then you'll come scattered in the altar after you destroyed everything that God's done. What would happen if you just loved God and you loved Jesus? You know what? When I'm loving Jesus, I'm loving my wife. My wife will love me back. When I'm loving Jesus, I'm loving my children. I'm loving my people at my workplace. I'm loving my family. I'm doing everything right. It all starts with that relationship With God. How's yours this morning? How's yours? You know, a couple quick examples this morning. In Luke chapter 7, verse number 37. And behold, a woman in the city whose name, or who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flax and fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. She began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair on her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he spoke to to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would never or would would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him for she is a sinner she was a woman named Mary Magdalene who was a prostitute who didn't understand the way that some of you understand wasn't raised the way that some of you were raised she found herself a sinner she found herself beaten and abused and manipulated by man after man after man. But she heard about a man named Jesus who was sitting in the religious Pharisee sector. And when she came to him, she didn't know what to say, and she didn't know what to do, but she brought her little her little box of fragrance and oil, which was everything that she had, and she broke it open, and she began to wash the feet of Jesus and wipe them clean with the hair as the tears ran down her face. I'm telling you, there's some Mary Magdalene's in the building today that you've struggled with life. You've struggled with decision. You've struggled with reality, and you find yourself all that you have to bring is you because you don't have anything else to bring. You've done wasted it. You've done thrown it away. But if you would just sit at the feet of Jesus and give him what you have, he will reach down and touch you and change your life and you'll fall in love with Jesus. Woo! You say, preacher, I ain't got a suit to wear. You say, preacher, I, I don't have the pedigree. Preacher, I don't have the education. I only went to the fifth grade or the sixth grade. Honey, God knows you, and he knew where you were going to be. And he said, if you'll just come all to me that are heavy laden, I will give you rest. He wants to love you this morning. He wants a relationship with you this morning. But you've got to be willing to fall in love with Jesus. The last example that I'll give you today is in the book of Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verse number 41. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many that were rich put in much. 
Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which made her quarters. She put in two pennies. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given money to the treasury. For they put, they all put in out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had. Have you truly this morning given him all that you have? You're never going to be satisfied with the things of this world. You're never going to be justified into thinking that you can continue on this path that you're down and break down. Some of you are already past that point in your life. morning more than anything else is to fall in love with Jesus you know I've learned things from both of my parents through these years I learned from my mother how to talk to people and not be afraid of people how to treat people how to accept people and love people unconditionally. You know, Sandy, my in the room today, her and her husband were wonderful ministers through the years. He's in heaven. Johnny, that preached homecoming for us a few weeks ago, that's his mother. And I look at Jim, and I look at the heritage that we have, umpteen preachers that have come from that side of the family. And the things that we learned. But what I learned from my dad was to love Jesus. Because truly, I can look back in his life, and that's all that mattered to him. I could come home from a game and score 26 points, have 15 rebounds. He didn't really care. You know, I had a curfew. I could stay out till midnight on Friday night. But on Saturday night, I had to be in by 10 because we had to get up and go to Sunday school the next morning. And Dad wanted me in bed at a decent hour. And I remember all my friends, they'd just be getting going and I'd have to go home. But it was more important to him that I learned how to love Jesus I remember a time when I was just a teenager that I had failed and made a mistake. And I remember talking to my dad about it and him sharing with me and me wondering if he was going to cha-cha, cha-cha, cha-cha. He knew I was hurt. He knew I was repentive because my dad had the same philosophy that I did. He'd rather hear it from me than somebody else. The only thing that he asked me, he said, son, did you ask God to forgive you? Have you made it right with God? That's what he cared about. He taught me how to love Jesus. He wrote a song, Jesus, I love you more than life. We played it at his funeral. It's the song that he'll be remembered by all his life. When I look at my mom, she loves Jesus too, don't get me wrong. She taught me how to love people. But my daddy taught me how to love Jesus. If I could teach you anything this morning, if I could tell you anything, that travel ball doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Those sporting activities that I'm even involved in and coached through the years, 15 years from now, nobody's going to, all you athletes that played through the years, we've got some red hounds in the house today when there's 5,000 people uh, welcoming you to the field. Where are they now? They don't care about you. Life goes on. What matters is that you fall in love with Jesus. 
Where are you this morning in your relationship with God? If something were to happen to you, do you know him? Do you know that everything is okay between you and God? And that if you were to stand in front of a just God this morning and he opened up the Lamb's book of life and you give an account for your life to this point, If your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, you will not be permitted to enter into heaven. Where are you this morning? I want it to be when they flip to your page and they see your name, they'll say, there's G. He was in love with Jesus. There's Jim. He was in love with Jesus. There's Sylvia. Oh, yeah, no doubt. She loved Jesus. There's Ronnie Smith. He loved ketchup. Bubbles. Oh, yeah, and Jesus. Will you please stand with me reverently all over the building today? And I'm asking you. Please, no moving around, no distraction before because the Holy Spirit is moving in this house right now. I'm asking you to close your eyes and bow your head just for a moment. And I want you to think about everything that's been said today. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart right now. Just you and God, take a moment. What's God speaking to you this morning? For some of you, you need to fall in love with Jesus today. You need to come to this altar and you need to ask him into your heart and ask him to forgive you for your sins and say, God, I don't know exactly what to do, but from this day forward, I'm going to put you first in my life. I'm going to seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these other things will be added. The Holy Spirit's dealing with you today, my friend. I see it on your face. I feel it in the room. All that I can do is I'm going to lead a prayer and I'm going to pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, would you let the convicting power of the Holy Spirit fill this room? Lord, there's a dozen people in this room that would split hell wide open if today was their day they entered the kingdom. God, let today be the day of salvation and let day be the day that someone turns their life over to you. Lord, there's some people that have some serious sin in their life. They have some unconfessed sin in their life. Lord, would you let your convicting power lay it upon their heart today that they will feel an urge to pray and come to this altar and spend some time with you. Lord, will these altars be filled today with people that are sincere about who you are? In Jesus' name, with every head bowed and every eyes closed, how many of you say, Preacher, talking to me this morning. I need God in my life. Would you just raise your hand? Put it right back down. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Who else? Be real. Who else? Be real. Thank you. God bless you. How many of you say, Preacher, I know I'm saved, but I haven't actually been living for Jesus. I haven't been in love with Jesus. I need you to pray for me when you pray. I need a closer walk. Would you raise your hand just for a moment? Thank you for being real. Thank you for being real this morning. I love you. I care about you so much. All that I can do is I can ask you to come to this altar and I can let you feel that peace that I feel and let you feel that Spirit of God that I feel this morning. Here's what I want you to do while the Spirit of God is moving. Would you simply just just look at that person next to you? Go ahead right now, look at them and ask them. Just say, hey, would you like to go pray? Go ahead, ask them. Say, would you like to pray? If they say yes while we begin to sing, would you bring them to the altar? I hope somebody obey the Lord. There are people that raise their hand that nobody asked them this morning. Would you obey the Lord? That's it. Come out of your seat. Come on. Come and fall in love with Jesus this morning. Come and fall in love with Jesus this morning. Hallelujah.